Welcome to Redemption Church Online. We are so glad that you are joining us this morning, and uh, we got a great service for you today coming to you. My name is Trent. I'm the worship pastor. If you're joining us for the first time, maybe you're joining us for the manyth time and you've been around here forever, whatever the case is, welcome. We're so glad you're watching us here today. You know, last week we had a pretty awesome week, just to uh, remember and kind of highlight that in case you missed it. We celebrated 10 years as a church. That's pretty awesome, right? 10 years of Redemption Church has been going. We had a birthday party, we had some cake, and we had cupcakes and everything. It was great. We met at the pub for the first time, too, right across the street from the hub. It was awesome. The place was packed out. Out. There was people in there, but there was enough room for everybody to have a seat. It was super fun. And uh, if you want to find out any of our things, our main thing, just to let you know, is to get our app, right? You can download, if you look up Redemption Church Duval, okay, you can search that for whatever apps you use, and you can, App Store, I guess you use, and uh, you get that, and you can get the details of news and events and what we're doing, especially if you need to know, like, what time the service is, right? I talked to some people who kind of miss the time of service, even though, like, we say it all the time, because we know, we just say stuff, and are you guys truly listening? Hey, like, you're listening, but, like, does it compute, right? So if you want to know when is service, right, go to the app. And you can look up there. Someone's laughing because someone here actually kind of happened to them. So if you want to find that stuff out. And if you do wonder what time is the service, what time is the service, Caesar? 9.30. 9.30. Join us for 9.30. And next week, here's our big news. Next week, we are going to be back at Cedar Crest High School for the first time in, I think it's like 18 months, something like that. It feels like forever. So we really hope you would join us. We will be broadcasting live from there, too, from the school. So that will be great. And uh, we'll just be praying all those things work out, right? We're going to get back in there and uh, have all that stuff happening. But um, it's going to be awesome. So 9.30, okay? 9.30 next week. Let's get ready to worship this morning. As we do, uh, I, you know that verse? It's the one verse that everybody knows, John 3.16. And we sing this song that kind of has that in there. And, uh, you know, sometimes people just think of that verse as, oh, that's just what Tim Tebow wears right underneath his, you know, when he was playing football and stuff like that, or the sign that you see. But there's such powerful words. And that verse is such a powerful verse for God loved the world so much that he gave his son that we would have eternal life, right? It just speaks so much to us, and there's so much that we can praise God for in that simple little verse. That just the fact that he loves us so much that he gave the gift of his son, his one and only son. He promised us, right, that we would not perish, but that we would have that eternal life with him. That's a lot to be thankful for. We have a lot to praise God for. So if you're at home there, wherever you're watching from, I just want to encourage you, turn up the volume on this. Stand up, sing along with us, worship and connect and have a grateful, joyful heart to God for what he has done for us, all right? Yeah. Here we go. Here we go.
you, God. Help us to just focus and find new ways, God, and new expressions, God, to go maybe sometimes beyond our comfort zones, to, to lift our voice with a shout of praise, God, to, to lift our hands and holy surrender, Jesus, because you are so mighty and worthy, and you have done so much, God. You gave to us. You've forgiven us. You've promised us life, Jesus. And we thank you for that, God. Give us a grateful, joyful heart, Jesus, for all that you have done in our lives, God. Thank you for what you are doing. And just continue to do, Jesus. We praise you. We love you, God. In your mighty, majestic name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks so much for worshiping this morning. Redemption Church. Welcome once again to our brand new series, Crazy Stuff Christians Should Do. Now, for you right now watching, it is Sunday morning. That is real time for you. But for me, this is actually Thursday night. This is why I'm wearing my jersey. I literally pressed pause at the end of the third quarter. Russ's finger was busted up. We don't know where the game's going to go. And so after this, I'm going to go home. So don't tell me what happens to anybody in the meantime. So yes, I am actually out of town this weekend. So if all of you sitting at the bar right now, you're like, why are we watching Matt online? Well, because Matt's out of town. I'm at a wedding this weekend. I'm excited. After 31 years, Ellen and I are finally tying the knot, getting married out of town. No, we're not. I'm kidding. Doing a wedding for some friends, so we're out this weekend, but then again, I'm looking forward to next week when we're all together up at the high school finally or online, so we're going to have both options. It's going to be great as we continue to just kind of look at the series and see what it is God has for us and how he wants to do some new things and new work in our hearts. Now, 
I want to remind you that we have an app, and in the app are notes. You can follow along throughout the series, and then there's also questions after those notes, which we're using in our regroups, which is our version of small groups. If you've wanted to think about a small group, this is a great time to get plugged in. We have both digital formats for that and physical gatherings for that as well, uh, and so you can look on the app and get the information for that, or you can email the office or Pastor Scott, myself, whomever, and we can give you information about that, but we would love to have you join up at the regroup for this series just because it's another way to kind of ground everything. So I'm going to go ahead and pray right now because we've got an important topic for the day. So we're going to go to, to Jesus and let him begin to already get us ready for what he is he has for us, and then we're going to get right to business. So let's go ahead and pray together. Jesus, I thank you for even the fact of technology that allows us to do this and to utilize this format and to communicate your word and Hopefully then from that, your word is transforming our lives so that we are looking for you, we're seeking you, and we're seeking to represent you in the world that we live in. And I certainly pray for this series that it is something that is uh, sinking into our souls, you know, that we're really using this as a time to maybe for some of us do a reset, maybe for others of us it's just dusting off some of the cobwebs, for others it's just taking that next deep step of faith, whatever it might be. I just pray that we will look to you to do some pretty awesome things in us as individuals and certainly in us as a church because we know that life is better with you, Jesus, and we want others to know that as well. And so we look to you today to guide, to teach, to show, and to stimulate our our faith and our trust in you and ultimately a growth in wisdom when it comes to you. And so we look to you, Jesus, now, and we thank you for the grace you show us in your good and kind name. Amen. All right. So um, I don't know how much you keep up with Christian news or Christian outlets, podcasts, whatever it is, but one of the big kind of buzz topics that has been kind of being talked about, certainly for the last year, it, it goes back further than the last year, but I've heard it a lot more in the last year, is this idea of people deconstructing their faith. And oftentimes when this gets talked about, it's in the negative because what you have is people so deconstructing their faith, there's no faith left after the deconstruction. So it's just a demo job, everything's wiped out, stripped down to the studs, the studs are wiped out, taken off to the dump, and nothing gets rebuilt. That's problematic deconstruction. But there's also a good form that goes on as well. And the good form is where sometimes we tear down old assumptions, we tear down some of the old ways we used to think, we tear down our legalism, our baggage, our religiosity, and we get to a purer, truer, more authentic walk with Jesus. Maybe we let go of some of the things that used to kind of hold us back or create a little bit of a hypocrisy in us or even a sense of heaviness about our faith, and instead there's a new lightness and joy and a sense of power behind it, that's where deconstruction can be healthy. And so for this series, what I'm actually wanting to do is to invite all of us, I'm giving permission, in fact, for us to maybe engage in a little bit of deconstruction, to maybe tear at some of the edges of our perceptions of our faith, and from that, come forward with something new. Because as I've been thinking about this more, I've been thinking about something that I want to push on a little bit and maybe encourage us to think about, and even in some ways for me to say like, hey, I'm not sure this is great. Now, the way I want to start this is a little strange because what I've been thinking about is this idea that I, I think we as followers of Jesus, we need to look at our faith a little bit differently because what I don't want us to continue to do is simply live for Jesus. In fact, I'm not sure it's healthy that we live for Jesus, that we do for Jesus. Now, let me be clear what I mean by this, right? This idea of doing things for Jesus. I've seen so often in 30 years of ministry where people kind of engage in that, but oftentimes when they're trying to do things for Jesus, it can look a lot less like Jesus and a lot more like religion or legalism or religiosity in some way. Uh, it, It just has the trappings of something that isn't quite, I think, what Jesus was inviting us to. And so instead of living for Jesus, I want us to think about what it means to, ready, live with Jesus. Because I think there's a difference. See, I find so often when I even reflect on my own life historically, and I wanted to live for Jesus, it was all about me being strong enough, me being tough enough, me being focused enough. And then from that, I was pulling from my own reserves. 
But if we understand what Jesus invites us to, which is to do life with Jesus, that we would do everything in the context of things with Jesus, that Jesus is along with us for the ride of life, then from that, there's going to be something more authentic that comes out where it's not me trying to white knuckle it, but rather it's his power flowing through me, his life throwing through, flowing through me because I'm doing it with him and not simply for him. In fact, to kind of build this out a little bit, if you're taking notes with us this morning, it's the first point in your notes. It's the difference between witness and withness. I want to say that again. It's the difference between witness and withness. Now, here's the part where I say this. I was thinking about this um, throughout the journey of my Christian experience. Uh, there were so many times where there was this sense of push or pressure that was like, hey, you got to make sure you have a good witness. You got to make sure you're witnessing to people. You got to make sure that you are thorough in this idea of our witness. In fact, I remember even as a high school student, we'd go to camp every summer and our camp, you ready? It was on the beach in San Diego. Very rough, I know, right? But here's where it was rough. They would have us go down the beach every single day and they'd say, you have to go down the beach and witness to people. And so you know what it's like to actually be walking down a beach in San Diego and stop and be like, um, excuse me, can I tell you about Jesus? And they're like, bro, you're in my son, go away. You know, there's lots of rejection. But then you felt this like guilt, like, well, I'm not doing my job if I'm not, and so I need to witness better and everything else. And, and I found so often in that context, it was this pressure of you need to perform, you need to do, you need to act, you need to engage these rules that we're applying on life. And then from that, it was burden right? And I was having to pull from just this, this sheer kind of like tenacity in me to do what was expected of me because that's what my youth pastor wanted or that's what the group was doing or whatever else. There was just a sense of needing to conform. And so it was all about what I was expected to do. But so often it wasn't flowing from an experience that I was having with Jesus. It was I needed to do it for him, but I wasn't doing it with him. I was doing it because it was the obedient thing to do, but I wasn't necessarily doing it because I was so connected to him. I was so passionate about him. I felt so much of his love and grace in my life, and I was so grateful. I couldn't wait to hit the beach and go do this thing. Again, it was just like, okay, this is what's expected of me. This is what I need to do. And so this is why I think withness is so powerful, because when there's true with you can't help but be a witness, and it's going to be authentic. It's going to be driven by something that's deeper than just the supposed tos. It's going to be driven by the want tos. And see, I think this is important for us because I find so often uh, we will default in our Christian lives to kind of like checklists, right? Like we kind of wake up in the morning and we go, okay, what's the list of things I'm supposed to do? And I'll do these in duty. I'll do, the, do those in responsibility. I'll go to church and I'll read my Bible and I'll pray. And we're kind of just checking through the list so we make sure, you know, we did what we were supposed to do for the day. But that doesn't ensure withness. That just ensures at best that we're, you know, being responsible and we're doing healthy things and everything else. But but I'm more and more convinced that the strength of the Christian life, this idea that life is better with Jesus, we sense that when we're genuinely connected to him, when we're doing life with him, when we're relying on him in every conceivable way, and we're just popcorn praying all through the day with a desperation to be connected to him. And I believe if we're doing that, I believe if that's the real journey of our life, that's the place we lean into, that's where we sense him and people will see more of him in our lives. In fact, I think about something that Jesus says in John chapter 15 that really kind of grabs hold in this. He says, yes, I am the vine and you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them, they will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And then I drop into verse 8. It says, when you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples, and this brings glory to my Father. Now, I believe when Jesus says this, it's not simply just like, hey, when you do the right thing, it brings glory to God, but rather when we're connected to him, we can't help but be fruitful. In fact, it reminds me of uh, this, this branch I have right here. Right? I think about how Jesus was always using illustrations from his environment, kind of pulling people in with that. And so you think about this right here. This is the perfect example of life where we're not connected to Jesus. 
And, and what I mean by that is that this branch right now, it seems very alive, right? The leaves are green. It seems like it could go on for a li- long time, but we know that it's, it's severed from its connection. It's relying on all of its own power to stay alive. And this will not continue to flourish. Over time, it's going to decay. This is not going to be bearing seed and fruitful and dropping more you know, uh, trees out into the woods. This is not going to happen, right? This is going to wither away, and eventually, it's going to be useless. And in the same way, Jesus is just illustrating that, saying, this is not what you want. You don't want to do it under your own power, because here's what happens. Over the course of time, there's like a spiritual entropy that takes place where we just lose the enthusiasm, we lose the motivation, we lose the passion, and from that we lose that kingdom edge. See, that's the thing we want to reclaim, that's what we want to be about, and that's the difference between just raw, determined witness and true, authentic withness. Withness stays connected. Witness sometimes just breaks off and we're just trying to white knuckle it and do it in our own strength and our own power for as long as we can and just kind of making it through life, but I don't believe that's what Jesus has. So that's why we're doing this series, Crazy Stuff Christians Should Do. And when we talk about the the theme of the day, I think it's interesting because it's one of those areas that I think is sort of uh, forgotten or sometimes underutilized, not appreciated, sometimes not even fully understood. But, But if we really grab a hold of it, it's like octane for the soul. It's like this thing that if you really lean into it and do it, God will show up in that in strange and weird and unexpected ways. And not every time in every way, but there's something about this that he honors in our lives. Now, last week, we talked basically about getting things off our chest to God, right? We talked about prayer, and the prayer was longing for God, leveling with God, and listening to God. Well, this week's topic is boldly connected to last week's. It's the Mac to its cheese, all right? So I want you to understand that you cannot take last week and divorce it from this week. These have to be bolted together in life, right? And so the topic, the theme for the day is very simple. It's this, skip dinner. Skip dinner because it might just change your life, or at least it'll lower your BMI, all right? So we're going to see some benefits in this either way. Now, when I say that right now, I give you that topic. What is the thing you think in your mind of all the different spiritual pursuits we can have? You're thinking, fasting, as somebody said it even here in the room. Fasting is our topic, and you're like, whoa, fasting's the thing? Fasting can grow me spiritually? Fasting is going to be helpful? Yeah, it's a little crazy, which is crazy stuff Christians should do, but it is a thing that God blesses in tremendous ways. Now, as we go into this, I want to let you know, just up front, fasting is not just a Bible thing, right? Other religions fast. People will fast for health reasons, for psychological reasons. They'll fast just simply to lose weight. Like, there's all sorts of reasons for why people fast in life. But the Bible, when it gets into it, it has some very particular things. And what's interesting is when we come across fasting, it's in the Old Testament. But when Jesus rolls in on the scene, he actually takes this idea and he flips it a little bit. He spins it. And so there was an old way, and then in Jesus, there's a new way. And it's that new way that I want us to unpack today. But we have to kind of measure that against the old way. So to do this, we're looking at number two in your notes. Number two is not so fast. We're supposed to fast, but we need to start with the not so fast. So this occurs in Matthew chapter 9. It says, one day the disciples of John the Baptist came to Jesus and they asked him, why don't your disciples fast like we do and like the Pharisees do? And so Jesus replied, he says, do wedding guests mourn while they're celebrating with the groom? Of course not, but someday the groom will be taken away from them and then they will fast. So Jesus kind of lays this little thing out, but then he adds something, this little added gem that is kind of peculiar to the context. Verse 16, he says, besides, which means that's directly tied to the theme. He says, besides, who would patch old clothing with a new cloth? For the new patch would shrink and whip away from the old cloth, leaving an even bigger tear than before. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. For the old wine skins would burst from the pressure, spilling the wine and ruining the skins. New wine is stored in new wine skins so that both are preserved. Now, here's why that's weird. Uh, typically, we don't think about that old new wine skin story as being connected to fasting. But that is precisely where Jesus puts it. And in all gospel accounts where this 
question of fasting comes up, that's the immediate thing that flows out of it. And, and, and so let me see if I can give you a picture of what's kind of going on here, right? These people come to Jesus and they're like, okay, we're Baptists and we fast, right? Because they're all from John the Baptist. They're the first Baptist, right? So we're Baptists and we fast. And the Pharisees, they're Pharisees and they fast. But Jesus, you and your crew, you're running around like it's a big wedding feast party and everybody's stuffing their face and drinking and having a good time. And why do you do it that way? And this is why Jesus says, well, let me give you an explanation, which is we're preparing for a new way of fasting that's different than your old way of fasting. There's the old wineskin style and there's the new wineskin style. And so he's trying to set them up to understand that the way his disciples will eventually do it will be predicated under different conditions or a different heart than the way they've been doing it as a society up to that point based on the Old Testament. So in other words, Jesus is saying there's going to be a new way that's different than the old way with new motives and new focus. So when you go back and look at the Old Testament, you see basically there was four different reasons for why people would fast. Some people would fast to consecrate a person or a thing, like Joshua, right? He was consecrated through fasting. Or people would fast out of sorrow, like the death of King Saul. Or they would fast because they were asking God to do a big thing, such as maybe like Nehemiah would, would fast for. Or you even have people like King David who was fasting out of grief and sorrow as his young newborn son passed away due to his own uh, sin and, and misjudgment. Right? Those were all the old ways of fasting. But Jesus is like, man, that's old school. Because here's the thing, now that Jesus is on the scene, because of what Jesus does on the cross and resurrection, he consecrates at a whole different level. He kind of deals with our sorrows in a completely different way. He meets our needs as a true mediator. Even the issue of forgiveness and sorrow is transformed in Jesus. So Jesus is like, all the old reasons and ways for why you fasted, it's going to be different under me. That's an old style, getting retired but one day there will be a new style. And the new style is going to kind of build out here with point number three. It's not so fast, so as to fast. Not so fast in the old way, so as to fast in the new way. Again, I want to point your attention to verse 15. Do the wedding guests mourn while celebrating with the groom? Of course not. He's there on the scene. Jesus is with them. But someday the groom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. Let me see if I can help us on this. I'm going to build some bookends, right? And I'm going to use last week and this week. So last Sunday was Communion Sunday. And if you think about what communion truly was, it was a meal, right? And what did Jesus say they were to do at that meal? Every time they take it, they do it in remembrance of him. So the feast of communion is looking back to Jesus' first coming. But here Jesus says, after I'm gone, you're going to fast. And the fast looks ahead to his next coming. So we feast looking back at his first coming, and we long, we fast, we hunger for his next coming. And so this is the way that Jesus is going to help us to understand why we fast, what it causes in us, how it's actually a hungering, a longing, a driving for wanting him to show up, be big, return, do that final big event that we've all been longing for in life, right? So it's the hunger for Christ in our lives, and it's a hunger for Christ to emerge into the world in such a way that the whole world sees this is the one, right? Like that's the heart behind this whole thing. And so the reason that we as New Testament Christians want to fast is because we're saying, Jesus, we want you to come. Jesus, we want you to be expressed. Jesus, we want you to renew all things. In short, what we're saying is, Jesus, we want you to be revealed. Revealed. And while in one sense, you know what, that, that means this idea, this cataclysmic alteration of the universe by which this giant city comes out of heaven and it's the new Jerusalem and plops down on the planet, all things are made new, like that's part of it. But here's the thing I think it's important for us to understand, and this, this theme is throughout the New Testament. There is this reality that while we're longing for that final coming, every day we're moving closer to that coming. Every day there's a realized sense that that is embarking on the horizon. So every single day, heaven and earth get closer when it comes to touching. And so just as much as we are fasting that Jesus would come on that final day, 
we are also fasting very personally in such a way that says, Jesus, come upon my life today. Show yourself today. Reveal yourself today through my life. And and I'm fasting so that you would do that. And I'm also fasting that you would reveal yourself to the world in that final event that changes everything. With that, I want to look at number four in your notes. It's the idea of tweeting the book of Revelation. Tweeting the book of Revelation. And by the way, in your notes, you'll notice it says, not revelations, okay? So let me help you here. It's a little theology lesson for just a second. When we look at the book of Revelation, a lot of people will say, oh, I'm curious what the book of Revelations teaches. Is this the time of the revelations? What is the meaning of revelations? Well, let me help you. There's not revelations. There's just one revelation. Turn to the end of your Bible, look at it. There's no S on the end of the word. It's not revelations. It's just a singular revelation, And sometimes people get excited about the book of Revelation, and they're like, well, what is the mark of the beast? When is the end of the age? When is the one world order? What does all of this stuff mean? You know, what's 666? And they're asking all these things. Here's the deal. Revelation, while that stuff's in there, that's not what Revelation is about. Revelation is one revelation, and it tells us right at the beginning of the book. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And the word revelation means revealing. So the entire 22 chapters is just simply to remind us that Jesus is being revealed and Jesus will be revealed. So when we think about the whole flow of time, when Jesus came into the world, he was revealed. When John writes the book of Revelation, his encouragement is one day he will be fully revealed because he's been revealed and he's still being revealed through the life of his church, which is why it's written to seven different churches. And the warning to those churches is basically don't lose revealing Jesus to the world because one day he's going to be ultimately revealed to the world. And so that's the message of the book. And so while we fast longing for that final revelation, We also fast and we say, Jesus, I want you to reveal yourself to my life in such a way that I can reveal you to the world. I want there to be such a withness that I'm so transformed that the world can't help but see you and me. And therefore, there's a sense of little mini micro comings in our lives as we long for his final coming. See, this is why I say we all get to tweet revelation through our own lives. We all get to tweet the revealing of Jesus. And for whatever reason, when we read through the Bible, there is this strange thing that says, you know what? Uh, When we lean into him, he shows himself through us. When I hunger for him in deep longing, he displays himself more in us. We show this grace-filled, love-driven, truth-living, everyday missionary status, and that's what the world needs to see. In fact, we even see that's the heart of God to do this through us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It says, so we are Christ's ambassadors, and God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. I love this because it's like, man, God is in you wanting to get the message out. God is in you wanting to reveal who he is. You are Christ's ambassador. And back in the New Testament period, if you were an ambassador of a king or a dignitary, you were as good as the real thing as far as how those received you, right? So in that sense, there's this message in 2 Corinthians where it's like, man, you want to get in touch with the one whom you represent because that's how the world sees him. They see him through you. That's the space we want to live in. That is the place we want to be. And again, for whatever reason, this idea of hungering spiritually is connected to fasting physically. In fact, to look at that, it's number five in your notes. Fasting as spiritual fuel. Because I believe fasting is spiritual fuel. Just in the same way we say food is fuel, strangely enough, fast and fasting is fuel as well. And just so we can clear this up really quick, when I talk about fasting, what I'm talking about is actually skipping a meal, skipping a group of meals, maybe skipping it for a day, maybe skipping it for more than a day. That's fasting. Fasting is not necessarily saying, I stopped watching TV for a little while. Fasting is not, I gave up beer. Fasting is not, you know, I'm not going to do dessert for a few days. That's called Lent, all right? Fasting is actually saying, I say no to food, I engage in a physical hungering as an illustration and as a connecting point for my spiritual hunger for God. That's the heart behind it. And so how is fasting fuel? Well, again, don't forget what I said at the beginning, 
right? So last week and this week are connected. It's the Mac to our cheese. So we have a longing and we have a leveling and we have a listening spirit as we engage in what I'm going to call the five E's or E5 fasting. And we're going to blaze for these because they don't think they take much time to unpack at all, but they're five E's that I think are kind of the New Testament, new wineskin way that we're to engage in fasting, or at least to understand it or understand what it does in us. So E1, pretty simple. Fasting helps us to expose, there's our first E, fasting helps us to expose our truest selves before God. Here's what I mean by this, and I've I've learned this through personal experience. Um, What fasting does, especially if you do a prolonged one, it's not like just skipping a meal, it's like skipping several meals, doing it for a few days. What fasting does is it reveals your truest you, right? You know what we call it today? Being hangry, all right? But what happens is, is the longer you go, see, because here, here's like what I realized. I used to think like, man, I'm a really nice guy. I'm easygoing. I'm a peacemaker. I don't get easily agitated. I don't argue. I'm not that guy. Man, I'm pretty awesome, in fact. I'm thinking like I'm a pretty studly person when it comes to self-control. And then I fast for a length of time, and all that ugly that gets suppressed comes up to the surface. It's like Jesus uses the fasting to say, Matt, there's still some work to do on you. In fact, remember, I, I remember one time I, I fasted for a rather lengthy period of time. It was when our kids were all younger and everything else, and I just became more curmudgeon and kind of jerkish and unhelpful and everything else. And my wife came to me, she's like, you got to stop because you're being a real sinful person in your fast. <laughs> and I remember I was kind of thrown back by this, and then she goes, well, you know, even Jesus went to the desert for 40 days with nobody. Maybe you should do the same. And so then I'm like, oh, maybe that has something for me to learn, you know? And I kind of realized, like, oh, this reveals in me that I still have some stuff to work on. But then it reminds me about Jesus when he went to the desert. In fact, in Matthew chapter 4, it says, Jesus is led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. For 40 days and 40 nights, he fasted and became very hungry. You think? It says, during that time, the devil came and said to him, dot, 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 and we know that there was three temptations, plus every other temptation known to man, it says in Hebrews. That's a lot of stuff. But what that reveals to me is not only the level of his temptation, but the depth of his character because you're hungry, you're tired, you're depleted, all the ugly can come out, right? Especially since the first temptation is just get some food, right? Like there's all sorts of things that that can tempt us in our weakness, and yet Jesus stands strong. And so for me, I look at fasting and go, man, part of the benefit of this is I see where I need to get stronger. I need to see where my character can develop. So in a weird sort of way, it's a backdoor kind of methodology to spiritual growth. And so that's one way that fasting is fuel. The second is E2. Fasting helps to extract our agendas and hear God's agenda. So we talked about listening. There's something about fasting that opens us up to listening in a different way. In fact, in the book of Acts, chapter 13, it says, Among the prophets and teachers of the church of Antioch of Syria were Barnabas and Simon, called the black man, which I love it. It's like there was a brother rolling with everybody there. There was Lucius, there was Manian, and then there was this uh, Saul, who eventually we know as Paul, and he's a pretty cool guy, right? But it says, one day, as these men were worshiping to the Lord and they were fasting, the Holy Spirit said, appoint Barnabas and Saul for the special work where, which I've called them to do. So then after more fasting and prayer, the men laid hands on them and sent them on their way. See, here's what's cool about this. Saul was not a good guy for a long time. And there was certainly a bias. You see it in the book of Galatians where people are like, oh man, I don't know about this dude. Like he killed our own. Do you really think God's going to raise him up to be an apostle? Right. That guy was a thug not so long ago, right? So there would have been hesitation. But these people set out to fast and to pray. And it was in that space, their own biases could get pushed out of the way and they could hear what the spirit really wanted to do, right? So their agenda was removed and the spirit's agenda was put in place because they were fasting, So fasting gives us the ability to listen in ways that we might not anticipate. The third E is fasting helps us to engage our urgency for God to act, right? There's something about it. It's just like, again, it's an octane boost. It's like chucking nitro into the system, and it takes us to a place that just prayer alone won't do it. In fact, in Mark chapter 9, there's a scene where the demons are dealing with a person, and the apostles come in, and the demon's so thuggish, they can't deal with the demon. 
And so it says in Mark chapter 9, when the disciples had entered the house after this whole event happens, they asked Jesus privately. They said, why could not we cast out that demon? And Jesus said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything except prayer and fasting. There's just something about fasting that pushes stuff over the top. And if you ask me what that is or why God honors fasting in this way, my answer is above my pay grade. I don't know. I just see it in here. I see examples of where when people do this, things happen. And I think part of that is just simply the fact that we have a reticence to want to do it. It's like, come on, man, really fasting? I'd rather snack. I'd rather feast. I'd rather enjoy myself. There's just something strange about the idea of fasting. Maybe God's like, right, that's kind of why I have you do it. Resist your most deep craving because you crave something more. You crave my power. You crave my presence. You crave my work. You, you crave my, my coming into the world or coming into your life in a powerful way. So for whatever reason, just, man, when we, when we fast and pray, it just creates an urgency. And you see that with Esther. You see that with Daniel. You see that with Ezra. Like when you go back in the Old Testament, it was when they prayed and fasted that big stuff happened. And so it's just something that creates this urgency for God to act. There's also E4. E4 is fasting helps to express our deepest priority. Going back to Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, 40 days, 40 nights, he fasted, he was hungry. During that time, the devil comes and tempts him, and he says, if you were the son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. Ooh, such a daring temptation. Doesn't seem like a big deal at all. Someday we'll unpack why that's a big deal. But for tonight, what we need to know is this. Jesus simply said to him, no, the scriptures say people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Fun fact, all three temptations are responded to by Jesus all three times from the book of Deuteronomy, right? So he just goes right back to God's word. But what I love about this first one is he says, you know what? Yeah, hunger is a powerful impulse. It's probably our most visceral impulse as human beings. And Jesus says, but I have a greater desire, a greater impulse. God's word is greater sustenance to me than the very mechanism of survival itself. That reveals his desire to feast on God, to feast on God's word, and to be driven and fueled by that. And so there's something about fasting that just says, God, I'm putting you first at this little season in my life because I want you more than even survival itself. Maybe that just leans into the final one, 5E or E5. Fasting helps to exalt our primary longings. And that just goes back to what Jesus said. When the wedding guests fast, would they fast when they're celebrating with the groom? Of course not. They can't fast while the groom is with them, but someday the groom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. They will fast for his presence. They will fast for his power. They will fast for his return. And here's the thing I think is really cool about this. As we fast for, for that coming, that longing, Jesus, you ready? He fasts with us too. In fact, there's a scene there at the end of his night with the disciples. After he gives them communion, he says, Mark my words, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Jesus says, you know, you're going to fast to long for me, but I'm going to fast the cup because I long for you. And I can't wait to be with you again one day in that setting. And so I encourage us to take up the crazy idea of fasting, right? Crazy stuff that Christians should do. Maybe that's one meal. Maybe that's half a day. Maybe that's more than a day. I don't know what your thing will be, right? And maybe some of you are saying, but I have medical conditions that don't allow me to do that. Here would be my challenge to you then. Say, you know what, maybe you take a day where you can't fast because of medical reasons, but pick like the food that's the most bland, the most uninteresting, the stuff you just wouldn't enjoy eating, and you, you just nibble on that to get you through the day, right? So it puts you in that space. And then maybe some of you are going to say, I'm going to fast, and then you fast for a little bit, and you don't go as long as you wanted to, and you feel like you failed. Listen, fasting is about a journey. Fasting is about putting us a place to say, God, I hunger for you. So don't, don't treat fasting like just another check mark and another goal to achieve. No, we enter into this thing saying, God, do the five E's in me. And I long for you, and I want to be with you. And may I learn the lessons that you have for me as I am longing for you and hungering for you in this space. Because you want to remember, this is given as a blessing, not a burden. It's a gift that he gives to us. It's not a demand he places upon us. 
It's just a tool for the soul to cry out. I long for you. I need you. I want you. Come up on my life. Come to my life today and show yourself through me as I long for you to come one day and show yourself to the world. Let's go and pray together. Jesus, I pray that we will have such a craving and a longing for you that we will engage this often forgotten gift that you've given. That we won't just be like, oh, that's, that's an Old Testament thing, or that's for other people, or that's only for really serious things. Once every five years, the church calls for a fast or whatever else. But, but rather, we would make this a regular regiment of our diet. Literally, it's like a regiment in our diet because we desire you. So teach and show and guide and challenge us to use these gifts, even the crazy strange ones, because you've given to them, us those gifts by yourself for our good, for our growth, and so that you can show yourself in us. So Jesus, we thank you, we look to you, and we love you in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. I want to sing the blessing over you that God would truly meet you. Maybe you really want to take some time and think about this, the challenge of that fasting. God speaking to you, God doing miracles through your life. Isn't that exciting to think of those things? Sometimes we tend to just go through life and not think that God can really do great things or speak to us in those ways, but he still does today. Receive these words. If you're sitting there at home or wherever you are, just close your eyes, focus on him and receive this. The Lord bless you oh, and keep you. Make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you, oh, and give you peace. Oh, amen. that you need to make it through this life, to make it through this week. Thank you so much for being with us here today. Do not forget next week we are back at the school. We would love if you were able to be able to join us there in person. It would be awesome. We're also going to be live streaming there from 2. At what time, remember? 9.30. 9.30, that's our new time. So thank you so much. You were sent to spread God's love, hope, and joy to the world. We will see you guys next week. Bye-bye.